And today I have Julia and Shana and their book, How We Got By. You know them because they have a scratch column in the business section of the New York Times. It comes out either every week or once a month. I think, does it shift how often it comes out? Changed. It used to be every other week and now it's double the size, but every two months. Oh, every two months? Gotcha. Yeah. Or well, six, six weeks, six to eight weeks. Yeah. And how would you say, how would you sort of synthesize both of your practice or your collaboration? Because you guys have collaborated for years, right? On several books. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'd yeah. say we tell stories together. Is that a good representation, Shana? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We tell stories about things and people that aren't always in the spotlight. Mm-hmm. So it's not like big celebrities. Um, it's like regular people that we tell stories about. And small yeah. businesses and yeah, walking on the street. I want to start out uh, by asking you guys about how you got into telling other people's stories or what you think their role is, why these people need to be represented. And also I think it's something you do that's really unique is that you have both drawn components and also written components and then also interview actual like direct quotes so how do we get started doing it or like why do we think it's important both (laughs) I mean well we we got started I mean both of us were always telling stories in different ways I guess like I'm I'm a writer and a filmmaker and Julia is an illustrator and a writer and so I'm a writer, but yeah, you were Thank writing, you. but we were, so we were both always telling stories either about ourselves or other people. And when we connected, um, it just sort of like, uh, multiplied. It was like the, what was that movie where like you pour water on something and then there's like a bunch of them, like the gremlins or something. I don't know. I yeah. feel like that's what happened for us is that we kind of, just like it just together it just like we worked each other up into a frenzy of wanting to tell more and more stories and I think we're both sort of addicted in a way to like we like this feeling we like the feeling of connecting with people and um and there's there's so many stories out there that aren't being talked about and and I think we also both particularly are really into the idea of like making things that feel shameful or embarrassing but aren't that like happen to everyone you know kind of airing those so so I think I think that's something that we're both interested in doing and it runs through our column in the New York Times but also through our first book which was about sex and bodies and now in this book um how we got by it's also there like this idea of of talking about things that you might only talk about privately or with friends but um, but that everyone is kind of harboring. Can we linger on that for a second and talk about why maybe airing airing these dirty laundry or, or I think that's the question or that's the like um, thing that people say about it. What is it about that 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 interests you or excites you? Julia? Um, hmm. I guess I feel like people have so much shame and like built up stuff that gets stuck inside and when they talk about it they feel better and feel less alone and and so I guess being there in the moment when they're feeling that release is is fun and you it's like this like I think also it's like intimacy it's like we are having intimacy with all these people that basically strangers for the most part like people on the street when we're going all around asking them to reveal their salary to the entire world through the newspaper you know and and the moment when they do it they're like you can see that it's like what do I care I'm I can tell you I feel good about this and like that feeling is really nice like to be there and experience that um but yeah ultimately it's like the connection and how do you get the most connection but by revealing something truly uh intimate and and something you wouldn't normally share are you surprised by how many people are willing to share 
Yeah, we get a lot of people. I mean, this book's 111 people. We talked to hundreds of people for the other book. And sometimes on in the streets of New York, it's hard. Like a lot of people pass before somebody will talk to us. Um, and that always gets me down. And Shana's always like, no, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. And then we always do. Um, but at first I'm always like, oh, it's never going to work. They're never going to talk to us. What's your sort of relationship to... And this sounds like tangential, um, but what's your relationship to sort of truth or definition of truth at this moment? Because I think like there's one thing of like, I, I'm sure people tell you the truth from varying degrees. Like if someone asks you, if like a random stranger asked me my salary, I don't know, that that would, I don't, again, like what what, do you think that people are pretty straightforward or do you think that people's understanding of what you're asking sort of shifts con contextually like because of the fact that you two are asking it hmm um okay. go go no I think for the most part you take people for their word you know you you gotta you have to just trust what they're telling you we use direct quotes only for all of our stuff so we're just taking their actual words, recording them and using them as the content for whatever we're doing. And um, I think if people are lying, I don't know, we still believe them, I think, right? I mean, I think that to be fair over the years, it's been obvious when someone has, to me, it feels very obvious when someone is lying and we don't use those people. And if someone is like a good enough liar that it's not obvious, then yeah, we take them at their word. But but for, for me, particularly when we did a piece about people smoking, um, there were some people that we interviewed that it felt like they were not being honest. And so we didn't use them. But but to me, it felt really obvious that they I were- I remember that. That's interesting. Why do yeah. You think, no memory of that. Why do you think people feel the compulsion to lie about smoking? I mean, I think like it's a, it's something that people are really embarrassed about um, because it really is like, it's a, it's a, it's a very strong addiction. Like it's, um, I mean, I think people in general lie a lot about addictions. Like, you know, they're not always honest about how much they ate or how much they drank or whatever, but um, with, with smoking, it's so often something that people are doing on the street or, you know, outside that people can see, but I think that they still want to like have some kind of power or control over how much it seems like they smoke. Um, uh, so I think people lied about that. It felt to me like these people were lying to us. And so we, we talked about it at the time and we were like, okay, we're not going to use them because they, it felt, and maybe they weren't lying, but it felt enough like they were that it was like, okay, well, we can't use this person. But other people, I don't know. It's like the way people say things, the way they come out with stuff, you can just kind of tell that they're like telling the truth. Like, you know, like either they're like hemming and hawing to tell you something or they're just like really matter of fact. Like, and so then it feels like, it just feels real. I think uh, I would love to have that barometer. I definitely don't think I'm a good judge of telling Um whether whether people are being honest or not, I think I tend to take people like Julia said, um, take people at their word and just assume that what they're saying is true because they're saying it. But it makes me think of this um, all throughout high school. I saw the same psychologist and I lied to her the entire time. And so it's, it's like a weird... Um, it's not something I'm necessarily proud of or anything, but at the time I was like, oh, I, this is the situation where I can present myself in the way that I want to be. And there was so much information in that, that, that like tendency to want to present um, the like idealized version of oneself. And so I guess I'm curious, like if there's still like finding the information, even in lies, there's so much truth, I guess, if, if that, if that makes sense, but I think like, so 
this is, I didn't mean to get tangential on like truth and lies and what is, where is the truth? But I do think it's really interesting that both of you can kind of sense when, when someone is like accurately depicting our shared reality versus like making, making stuff up. Um, for how we got by, did you, how did you choose which topics or which people, can you talk about the 111 people that, that you interviewed? Yeah, I mean, um, what I'll say is that it was a, a real journey making it because I think when we started, um, we wanted to have like 400 people and we wanted to have, I thought personally, I'll just speak for me, that we needed to like address every single traumatic thing that could happen to a person. Um, <laughs> but then as we started to interview people, we started to realize that like a lot of people had the same trauma, but they had different ways of dealing with it or that different that you could kind of because like each of the stories has like a bit of advice or like how they managed this thing. Um, it felt like that was translatable. So like someone could have survived the death of their father or, you know, gotten through this difficult time by doing xyz but you could use that same xyz to get through something else so then it started to follow this this goal of like reaching every single trauma kind of fell away and it started to just become about talking to people and hearing their stories and then and then the reason that we decided not to do 400 people was that it became clear that some of the stories needed the room to breathe like some of them are very short and succinct and they're they really work as like these little tiny pieces, like popcorn pieces, but then other stories really needed more room. And so we started to realize that it would just be unfair to the stories if, if we just were going after a number. Um, we did choose 111 because we liked that number. Um, but if we were like, oh no, we want to cut out the long ones or what, you know, it just didn't make sense. So, so now there's a nice mix of short, medium and long stories. And um, there are some stories that are about the same kind of trauma. Um, but, but there, but each of them feels unique. Like they're all about different people and, and told in their own voices, which is really cool. And so that makes it really fun to read, I think. Uh, unique but universal kind of yeah sense. totally yeah what are, Shana what are some of the sort of relatable not trauma or dramatic events that events that or experiences that you feel like you've combed from all of these interviews um well some like death of a loved one is definitely in there a lot um addiction is a theme that's we have a bunch of um there's some career stuff there's some relationships um like breakups or uh yeah there's a couple breakups um a couple non-romantic breakups or, or at least one um that's like a familial you know breakup um someone breaking up with their dad um yeah that and oh yeah divorces that's also breakups um then but then there's also things like health health and body like people um who had cancer or people who had um who gave birth or people who got abortions like there's you know different themes about the body as well what what story you were saying before we started recording recording that there are that you sort of carry around these stories both of you after um, after doing all of these interviews. And you mentioned that some of them kind of sh show up or pop up in your lives more frequently. Do you mind each sharing something that kind of resonates with you in this moment that we're in right now? Julie. Sure. Um, I always tell the same one, but maybe I'll tell, well, the, always, the one I always tell is my, we interviewed my therapist for this, my former therapist. And I want, I told her, I want you to tell this story that you told me, which she told me in therapy once about how um, everything was going wrong. Her daughter was in the hospital. 
um I, f- I think friends had just died she was just like in a really dark sad place and she was going to the hospital every day to take care of her daughter and see her and um she just was not doing well like gonna break you know and she wound up calling a meditation center and being like help I don't know what to do I'm like so sad and they were like well there's got to be something um there's got to be something that gives you joy and she was like well the lemonade's really good here at the hospital and um it was just like kind of a joke but they were like no that's perfect like go every day drink this lemonade enjoy it like savor each sip like take your time and have that be your moment and um when she told me that story like years and years ago I always think about that I'm like there's always lemonade there's always a lemonade so that was one that I've just had forever and then is wound up being in the book because I was like you gotta put this one in the book Uh, and it's told way better than I just told it um but then the other one when we interviewed Uli who um uh, she talked about uh, being 40 and not having kids. And of course, I was going through that at the same time. And I, everything she talked about like resonated so much with me. And I, I was like crying and she was crying. And like, it was like really nice to hear someone else say the things that I kind of was thinking and feeling, but didn't know how to articulate and like feeling like, oh my gosh. I'm not the only person having to think about all this and go through it. So that was also just the, that act of hearing somebody tell that story um, was good for me, I will say. And Shana? I, I, well, I had this one, this one person um, told a story, his name is Chris, and he told a story um, about getting divorced and the thing he told he said in it was that the best advice he received was his his friend said fight fire with marshmallows and um that's not just for divorce that's for anything you know obviously and i just like i i think about that every day um because i don't know i'm someone who can like easily get my back up or like be angry or annoyed or frustrated and whenever you fight fire with fire, it's just like more fire. But the idea of fighting fire with marshmallows is just sounds delicious. Like it sounds so much better. And I like that idea. And I have definitely applied it in pretty much all of my relationships since I heard it. Um, and I really think it works. Like if, if someone's angry with you, I mean, it's actually a thing that my, my own, my husband was also a different Chris does all the time with me and it works it completely diffuses me, my anger right away. And I, now when I use it, I find that it just, it's just so much better. And so that was one story, um, or one piece of advice from a story that I think about. Yeah. Wait, before you go on to another one, cause I want to hear more, but I also want you to talk about the example of what fighting fire with marshmallows looks like and, or how, how Chris, your partner does it with you. Like the sort of nitty gritty on on how to use it if if someone who's listening or if for example me wanted to try it like if I'm just like angry because I'm like oh there's this is just silly right but like there's like coffee grounds all over and I'll just be like um, annoyed about it it's like why can't why can't you clean up this stuff like this is so annoying you know and I'll just be fire angry and then Chris, my partner will be like, um, oh my God, you're right. It's so annoying. Can you believe this? I can't believe like he'll like immediately make it sort of light and jokey and like, how, what was I thinking? All these coffee grounds, you know? And then I'm immediately like, oh yeah, this is so not a big deal. And then it it's gone. And I have an eight-year-old. I also have a two-year-old, but it definitely works with an eight-year-old, um, like if you just push back on an eight-year-old, like you are going to lose the fight, like, or it'll just continue on and on and on. Um, and so in situations with my eight-year-old, like if he's upset about something, you know, it's the same thing. Like I'll just kind of be mushy and gooey with him and make a joke or be silly or, um, you know, and that just makes it so much better. And like, the thing is that I literally spent my entire life, I grew up in New York City, like I I spent my entire life, I feel like getting dates with people. And so (laughs) 
confrontation this feels is part of New York and it really is yeah but I feel like it's so much better like even I see now like my husband has like he has like road rage I think and now instead of being like mad if someone cuts him off or something he'll he'll go like this <laughs> um and like th- like he'll be like you good and they're always like I don't know. They can't. What are they going to say? Then they can't be mad. Like, it's just they just go on. It's not, you know. So anyways, I think I think anytime we can do that, um, it's good for the other person. But it's also just so much better for us because we're the ones who have to sit with all of that anger and feel it. And it's like when you're angry, it just feels bad. Like, it's not a good feeling. Uh, I no. can imagine getting very annoyed if somebody makes a joke out of my anger, though. Like, if I was like, man, I was saying they're like, Oh, I don't know. I'd be like, ah, it made me so mad. But I guess the way he does it, I know Chris and I feel like he'd make it fun. He does it in a way that's like, it's not making fun of me. It's like, like, he's like, oh my God, you're right. Look at all this. Like he. But that's like, is that belittling it or no? It is, but it's little. Like all of this yeah. stuff is little. Like everything is like, even, I don't know. I guess there's like big things, but. I don't know. I guess I just think like it's so much easier to come to like you can still have disagreements and like talk about things or air feelings, but it's better to come at that from a position of of lightness and softness than to be angry. Like it's you know, it's kind of akin to that. Like, would you rather be happy or be right? You hear people say that all the time and it never really made sense to me. And then it's it, recently it has with an eight-year-old I think it has started to make sense to me because I can see that he will get into this feeling of like he wants to be right and it's like dude it's not worth it just be happy like just be happy just enjoy yourself you know um but I can imagine from this story that it comes from in the book which is about divorce that if you're co-parenting a kid you have a, another person that you're like raising and you have to figure out all these details together that I can imagine that it's so much easier to find a nice way to do that if you or to to find a, a, a good way to do that if you're both coming from like a softer position rather than being upset with each other if you're angry and upset with each other then you're just going to make decisions to be right but if you're kind of like more relaxed about things I think you can be like oh you know what you're right, this is probably a better situation for our kid or whatever it is. That's that's kind of what I imagined it came from. I was sort of read between the lines. But then I think in my own life, even though I'm not doing that, there's all these ways to use it, you know. Or like I have my, my mom, she's 82 and I love her and I see her all the time. And she like can be so annoying. But if I just like let it it's like letting it go you know it's another version of all of those things I guess that's why that song was so huge that let it go song oh yeah no I mean I, let it be let it go you know from frozen I think from frozen. oh I don't know it uh For all the children's songs yeah I didn't really listen to it but it's like everywhere I feel like people always were like let it go hmm. but I think it's like a it's a really challenging thing that I hope is catching on because I feel like I don't know if this feels true but growing up I think you were taught to match subconsciously unconsciously match the other person's emotional intensity and so like being mindful of it feels feels really hard like as a practice in general um Hmm. and I'm definitely not good at it but I do like the idea of thinking about marshmallows um yeah writing yeah no what was the second one you were gonna say Shane oh um gosh which one I mean I think about all of so many of them are um Kai talks about using dancing to get through a dark period um I also think about a really sad one all the time which is that like after um, right after my second son was born, we interviewed um, a woman who is now like a, she's a grandma now, but she talked about losing her son at 16 months. And um, I just thought about that all the time until my kid turned 16 months. And I was like, okay, maybe he's fine. I don't know. Like, obviously 
God forbid it can happen. Anything, you know, can happen at any time, but that's definitely something that I thought about a lot. And I, I, and you know, she and another person in the book both really turned to nature to help them with things and like sort of like sunsets and, um, you know, just different things that happen, like, you know, bigger forces, you yeah. know, this idea that like the sun keeps rising. Um, and so that's something that those are stories that I think about a lot um, that I don't personally use the advice in them, but I, I think about them um, a lot. And yeah, I mean, there's just so, there's so many, like it's something else I don't know. This is maybe getting off topic, so I can not talk about this. But something that <laughs> you okay? Yeah. Um. Good at, at one point, so we, so we we interviewed um a Syrian revolutionary and someone who comes from oh, a woman who came from Afghanistan and um a man who comes from Sudan. And, and various other people from all these different parts of the world. And like within their stories was like a history of their uh, region that they were from. And also obviously like some political aspects of the U.S. Um, and just, just different. There was, there was like historical um, or history, history lessons in these personal stories. And that I thought was like really interesting. And there, were, so there was like a point when I was like, wow, this is like an alternate history of the world. And I mean, it's not because it's just a, it's 111 stories and it's only so many regions, but it was something that I found that I thought a lot about was that like, I, I learned so much. Um, like I kind of saw a different way to look at different things, like different um, events, like political events. And that was really eye opening. Um, and I, I think also, I don't know, anyway, so yeah, that was something that, that definitely sat with me a lot when we were doing it. Do you think, Julia, do you think anything changed? Like, because I think a lot of these stories, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, are, are how we got by this like really intense few years of pandemic. Like, do you think that anything fundamentally changed? Or how do you think from interviewing all of these people, we collectively have shifted I guess or if there are any like paradigms that have kind of changed that stick out to you not dissimilar to like the marshmallow fighting fire with marshmallows like people shifting and how, how they tell stories or what kinds of stories they're telling or what or being more open to sharing or Jeez. All of those things. I mean, I think like having a being our openness to talk about hard things, I feel like is something that really shifted for at least my circles or my understandings of what was appropriate to say. It's weird now for me, I think I'm having like a, a tightening of what I feel like I'm allowed to share in this moment versus instead of being, a, I used to think it was a real luxury to be able to share or not have shame because I knew that the people who loved me would continue loving me depending on no matter what I what I sort of thought, especially when like the context was expanded upon. But now I feel like there's a different sort of uh, vulnerability is kind of like a, a tool that I need to be careful of using. And that I, I think is an interesting thing that I wasn't because expecting. what what will happen that the people won't like a like a cancel culture type of thing a little bit but also like a I don't want to use it as a way to like I, I do think that maybe maybe it, it is coming from that but it's also coming from a I don't I, I don't want to like infect other people with my pain or sadness or um, I think I'm comfortable infecting people with, with joy, but I think I've been thinking a lot about like emotions as contagions, um, recently, but anyway, back, back to asking you, you guys, if there were any sort of shifts or changes in your perspectives after doing all of these interviews on like the condition of being human in sort of the Western world in this moment. 
I don't think I can make any. I don't think I'm like equipped to make that call on like what shifted. I mean, well, I'm talking to so many people who think something like before one thing, the pandemic. One thing I will say is that one of the stories is about a person who decided to transition during the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And the reason that they did that was not because of the pandemic, but they felt that they finally had the like social space to figure that out about themselves. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't be shocked. Like, this is obviously like, an like, what is the saying? Like an eyedropper? Like, this is like a very small amount of people compared to the world. But like, I wouldn't be shocked if that was true in other people's lives, if people took time. And I also think like people have called the, this last year is like the year of divorce. So like, I think that there's, there's been like this time that we've had that has been so strange in so many ways. Um, I think has like given people some room to like figure out a little bit, like maybe who they are or, or maybe that they don't know who they are or, um, some like room to explore. Um, that's, that's just like, that's just kind of like a, I think like that's a, accurate more so like in people I know than people we've interviewed because we don't know what their lives were like before or after but like that story is a good example that you told yeah. for sure. but in friendships and stuff so many people went through so many things during that time so many breakups and so many unions and um other things like that that yeah changed their uh, lives completely I mean I'm one of those people because I met Ollie during the pandemic and then fell in love and got married and bought an apartment and my life changed a lot you know so um yeah I think it did do a lot for people what do you think the sort of um I'm kind of know the answer to this but I'm curious if if I'm biased or if I'm accurate in saying this but I think I read Esther Perel called it the relationship reckoning and that we have in the media sort of both people getting together and people separating, but actually it was like a giant, if you look at the statistics, it was like very heavily weighted on people separating um, during the pandemic, not to say that you're an anomaly, no. um, Julia, but do you, was that sort of represented in the book or do you think that after talking to people, more people came together during the pandemic. I mean, I'm not saying that I think it's a good thing that people, uh, there's no value judgment on coming together or separating, just uh, like a reflection of what actually happened. I don't think there was anybody in the book who broke up because of the pandemic or talked about the pandemic at all, actually. Am I right? Besides that story. We kind of told people this wasn't a pandemic book because people came into it thinking, oh, let me tell you my pandemic story. And they're like, oh, no, that's not what this is. But people were, I mean, there was, there's no denying that like everyone, I would say that like a huge portion of the people we talked to like mentioned the pandemic in some way. And I also think that this book was inspired by the pandemic. Sure. So even though it's not like pandemic stories, um, but yeah, I mean, I think that like, I don't know if, if, uh, um, yeah, I guess I don't, I don't think that I'm trying to think of, go through all the stories and I mean, it feels like to me, like you're saying colloquially, like with our, with people we know and in the world, it does feel like there's been like a shift, um, but I, I don't, yeah, I don't think that's necessarily like in this book, um, aside from that one story about Sav transitioning. Um, is there something, Julia, that you feel like, why is it important to you to illustrate everyone? Or is there something you can sort of, something essential or a way that you, can you talk a little bit about using yeah I mean I think about everybody's always like oh your book it's like humans of New York except it's illustrated 
And I'm like, oh, kind of, I guess so. Yeah. I mean, it's stories of people and they're represented. But um, I think there's something really different between a photograph and uh, somebody's, I guess it's still somebody's interpretation of somebody because they're framing it. Um, but yeah, I guess I feel like there's like a nostalgia to illustration and, you know, the most, most people don't come in contact with illustration except in kids books. And that goes for the column too. Like you're reading a newspaper and, you know, you get to our column and it looks different from everything else that's in the newspaper. Cause it's like made by hand by somebody painting something. So, I mean, I think why it stands out and it feels like somebody made this by hand, somebody's, it's some, this person's interpretation of this other person. And I think that's something special. Like I do think, you know, it could be good with photos too, but this is like, um, it's not a real depiction of what they look like. Like it's my version of them. So uh, I don't know, there's something to that, to seeing somebody's version of something, I think. I don't have a great answer. I mean, Shane always answers this, like chimes in to answer this because it's like hard to see outside of it for me. I think, I think that's a great answer. I, I just was going to say, though, something that always happens is that um, people are like, oh, well, my eyes are a little bit red today. Or like, can you make, so like, I just- Always have to be thinner. Like, always, you, everybody. You, 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 or like, younger. Don't do my wrinkles. Don't do my yeah. hat. Or can like, you make my arms thinner? I've had so many crests well, make my arms thinner. It's like, why? Be you, be you. Um, and it's sad. And that we and always when I paint it, it's like, there's no details like that. You're not going to see the wrinkles. Like, I'm not that good. I'm not doing like a photorealistic painting. And they wind up like hardly looking like the people to begin with. Everybody's always they're like, that's amazing, what they like. But they're amazing. Like, the it's amazing. And it's their vibe. Like, it's these vibes of these people. And the yeah. things are well, incredible, but they're not... It's not like you're going to see like their bloodshot eyes in them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, maybe you would if that's like a thing. I remember yeah. with my, with um with somebody, I forgot to put their tattoo in and I had to add it in after. Because I was like, oh, sh I should put that in. It's like a face tattoo. And I totally forgot to add. You know, it'd be weird if I didn't put that in. But you are making choices like that, you know, and deciding like for that one, I I decided not to put the background. It's just like a floating shelf. Like you are making decisions about a space um, and what to show and what not to. I happen to really like showing people's stuff and the rooms around them and where they are. Um, Cause I think that really shows who they are. Um, and it's funny cause right now this is not my room. This is a rental and I feel so weird about it cause it's not my space and I'm not showing who I am by my stuff. Whereas you are right now, you know? And it's like, I always feel like that's so, that's something, some part of it. And I, I guess a photo does that too. I don't know. It's hard. I think yeah. that for me, I, it's hard for me to be objective about this in that I feel like there's something really special and magical about the human line or the touch or the, and the translation that somehow has to happen from the external world and then go through all of your experiences, all of your education, all existing yeah. before time. And then somehow like also it collaborates with your subconscious and your conscious mind and like the environment that you're sitting in, the clothes that you're wearing I feel like often can like depict uh, aesthetic choices for comfort and the lighting of the space that you're in are all somehow embedded into this, this visual. I love that a lot actually, because a lot of the time, like I'll do a painting and I'll be like in a really nice place in my house and I'll be really happy that day. And I'll, and then I'll do another painting and I'll be in a bad mood or something and it won't come out good. And I'm like, God, this portrait in this book would have been so much better had I been in like in a different place myself the day I painted it. And it's like all sort of like happenstance a little bit. Like some of the ones at the end were sort of rushed. And I always think like, oh, I should have taken more time and like sat, you know, it's like really does. It is about the human behind it and you know, how they were feeling that day. Like, I love thinking about that. But I don't know. Um, yeah, there is so much like 
digital art too now and manipulations of things it's like having a person using a pen and a real paint I feel like it's old school and nice and there's something to that too I wonder if generations after us um will have the same sort of appreciation for the translation like I'm assuming that you I don't know how you guys did the text for this if you if you listened if if you actually listen to it in your ear and then typed it up or if I don't know I don't know how you did it but there's also a weird there's a, a translating like a beauty in and care and attention that I think is something where a lot of meaning is embedded in that attention that I feel like all of your work really embodies hmm. no that's um, that's super important to me is that I listen to it all and write it up because you know there's like programs where you can just put the audio in and have a transcript spit out but I feel like for me it's like you have to really hear something and like hear it a bunch of times and because also the thing is like sometimes people say something and they're saying it like with an exclamation point or they're saying it with a question mark or they're saying it that's it they're saying it facetiously and that doesn't you know come across in just a transcription and so uh, I think it's like really important to listen to it all several times and write it all and then go from there like making sure that it's makes sense and you know I mean I think that this book is such a gift a to the people who are in it um to the idea of survival as humans but also this sort of ability for everyone to be seen somehow through the interviews in the book by reading it by consuming it by I mean I think that the the charm and the beauty and the care and the illustrations and the text I think I I found a lot of comfort I really enjoyed it I'm very biased because I'm a fan of both of yours but and because you're in it I am also in it, um, which I'm, I feel very lucky to be in it. But I think if there was like a a sort of thesis or a way that you wanted people to feel after reading it, how would you how would you describe that or the feeling that you would want them to have while they were sifting through it? Um, I always say less alone, but I wish there was a better way to say that. Like uh, comfort, I guess. Um, and um, cozy. Yeah. Hard stories, like especially when you read a lot in a row, they're like, oh my gosh, there's all these hard things. Like it's like a death, and then it's like, oh, is it sick? And then this person is like, hard job, wow. And then like, and you're like. That was a lot. But you know what it does when you read those? You're like, you go to your day-to-day life and you're like, oh, this thing I thought was so terrible that's happening, this annoying thing is not that bad. Guess what? All these people had like all these hard things they had to get through. And you're just like, it like lightens everything that feels hard in your own life, I think. And I think I would want that. Like, that's how I feel when I read these stories. So I would want that for everyone else reading them. But like I also in their heart stuff. I also think there's like a lightness to a lot of them though. Like there are other ones yeah. that are like there are some from kids that are like really light. And then there's other ones from from just you know from adults that are light or they're maybe about hard, dark, heavy things, but there's like a lightness to them. Um but I but I think mainly I think what Julia's saying is right, like this idea of like giving your life perspective and also feeling less alone. And then um, another feeling and cozy, I think the illustrations really help with the coziness and the, the fact that there are these um, it's like quotes from the people. So the, the voices are different. I think that makes it really fun and cozy, you know, like that it's like, like all these different sort of like dialects at once or something. I don't know that that is kind of cool. Um, But I think that, um, something that I feel like people who've looked at it say is that it's like popcorn. It's like, they can't stop. It's like potato chips or something. Like once you like read one, then you're like, Oh, let me read the next one. And then, you know, like there's, 
they're sort of like um, these digestible stories and they, and I think that's a nice feeling. Like you don't have to like read it from beginning to end, but you do sort of like get engrossed and feel kind of like you just want to keep going. Um, Julie, yeah, it's like a flip through kind of book. It's not like a beginning to end. It's like, let me open it, read some, save some for another day kind of thing. Yeah, that's how well, I. You should see what your mom said. Oh, when I can't even remember. She, I said, "Mom, would you buy this?" And she was like, "Why would I buy this? Because I'm old, you know. I I already got through everything I need to get through. I don't need advice." And then I was like, "Well, look at it." And she was like, "Reading." I'm like, "Oh, I like this. Oh, this is a good one. Oh, this, you know, like she got <laughs> into it." And then she's like, "Okay, I would buy this book." By the end, she was convinced. Yeah, she and she she said that part of what she liked was that they had it was these different voices. Mm -hmm. she likes the aspect of it it is it's like it's nice you know when you're there and you hear everybody's voice it's probably really different like I wish we could have like a podcast component because you like hear everybody's like raspy voice or like their quiet voice or like how they say a word and and, and when we do the New York Times we really have to stick to standards so we don't get to put in like or um like yeah, no. we take out words or we take out like things that aren't uh like real words like somebody's or curses or things like that and in this book we didn't have to do that so I think Shana was able to like capture really what these people sound like more than anything else we've ever done so I I'm I love that part of it like when we read it you really like can I go back and I can like hear the voice in my head of like what they actually sound like it's cool and when you read them out loud too, because I had to do that recently, it was like kind of hard because they're full sentences, but you know, they're in the voice of how you talk. They're not, ha they're not corrected to be like complete accurate, you know, like perfect sentences. So it's like somebody could do a run on sentence or they can talk more or less or have a little funny thing in there. And so when you read it, you're like, oh, I messed that up. I want to say it over again because I now I know what they meant, you know? Oh. Well, thank you both so much. I'm so sorry we're out of time, but um, I'll put links oh, to the no. book and both of your websites. Uh, we didn't get to talk really about the column and the breadth of or the previous your previous book, and then also if there were any sort of. I feel like all books have hardships and controversies, and so we didn't get to talk about that either. But um, thank you both so much for doing this. Thanks for involving me, and thank you for having um, letting or coming to talk to me about it in super such short notice. I really appreciate it.